Brucite. By the time the company reached the Rhyme Viaduct, the group following the soldiers had shrunken due to moist soles and the wind's bitter bite. Most of those unprepared for the journey had turned back for Scythica. Few previously ignorant to the Hyperborean terrain continued toward the enchanted bridge suspended over the deep gorges. Even though the viaduct had never failed, its clear surface could be terrifying to tread upon. Bruce had known many to give a prayer before heading across, and he knew more who would beg for safety once they glanced at the intimidating tumble awaiting them if they slipped. The path hadn't bothered him the previous time he had crossed it, when he had not yet been a man in the eyes of the lords and laws. Back then, the drop had seemed to draw out forever. He had pretended he was an angel, looking over the earth from the great height. Now that Bruceite was old enough to know he wouldn't be growing wings, he was more concerned. He wasn't going to show his nerves in front of anyone else, though. His parents taught him strict principles about putting on a brave face for others, to inspire hope and to assuage fears. As the first line of soldiers approached the drop, they stopped. A sea of clouds had settled in the gorge, precisely at the edge of the viaduct. Before anyone could proceed, they had to discover where the footing was. Once Bruceite bunched up with the soldiers ahead of him, he overheard, We will take our midday meal during this pause. Bruceite and Teliost sought out their commanding officer and reported for muster before they found their rations. Luckily for them, the freezing temperatures preserved the portions. Unfortunately, the food was partially frozen, even after thawing over a fire. Neither Basil nor the silent soldier with the rank of T-15 were around. For the time, Bruceite shared Teliost's company alone. Food shit. Teleos tossed the rest of his rations into the snow. Brucite watched the culinary specialist soldier, who had prepared and distributed their rations, dash between a dozen other fires to juggle those respective meals. It's what we have. Get used to it. Food's the only accommodation I'm accustomed to being good. If there was a river nearby, I could cook up a fresh fish better than anyone else here. Brucite wondered if that were true. Then again, the younger soldier descended from fishermen, not chefs. In response, Bruceite made a non-committal grunt. Telios went on. It sucks when you lose the one thing you can count on. Yeah. Bruceite continued eating and otherwise ignored him. Telios found the next complaint topic. I'm pissed about the clouds. They're ruining the view. We can't see the bottom of the tapoi. I find them whimsical. Without the clouds, you get the sensation of flying. With them, the sensation of sailing. Just hope you don't see the bottom of the ravine in an intimate fashion. I'm not going to fall. Are you giving a prayer to Asiel or Lelila to ensure that? Bruceite asked. I'm not going to bother wasting a prayer at all. Bruceite shrugged and shifted his attention around the area. Soldiers and crown hires sat crouched around hundreds of small fires that thawed their rations or purified their drinking water. Through the masses, Basil found them. Did you get lost? No, I had to speak with my master. What have I interrupted? Basil collected his ration from the fire, but didn't start on it. I was telling Bruceite that I wouldn't give a prayer for crossing the viaduct, Teleos said. Basil looked over his shoulder. A lot of other people are. How come you won't, Teleos? I don't see the use. We're all going to end up saved and condemned based on whatever our respective spawn chooses. Why bother to appeal to their predecessors? The archangels might bless you if you pray to them, Bruceite said. It's never worked for me before. You, Bruceite? Basil asked. I'll send a prayer to Asiel, but I doubt it will be necessary. Asiel never answers prayers. Probably got tired of answering too many requests. What did you need to speak with your master about? Bruce had asked Basil, ignoring Telios' snub. He wanted me to check in with him. He described an argument he had had with the map reader. The officer has no idea what he's doing and navigated us crookedly over the merchant's road. If he led us straight, the viaduct should have been directly ahead of us, marked by the memorial shrine. They can't see it anywhere along the horizon, though, Basil said. He also asked whether any of the soldiers had been substituted out around me, but I told him I didn't know. I don't understand the ribbons. Teleost interjected, I'll explain. I'll do a better job because I did better on the written exam. This first one represents which kingdom we serve. Purple is for Vetron. He pointed to the ribbons on his chest. The second one indicates our overall rank. Ashes for privates. The ribbons get lighter in color as you move up the ranks, so the lighter the better. Bruceite cut in. It's difficult to distinguish between similar shades when you're new at it. Don't worry if it's confusing. As I was saying, Teleos said as he threw a glare toward Bruceite, 
A third white ribbon indicates an officer knight. Those are M ranks and above. They're easy to spot because they'll be in gold armor rather than our bronze. You don't want to insult them. You must call them sir. If someone has more than three ribbons, then they have other special accomplishments or honors. You can guess what the number stamped under those means. Thank you. I would hate to insult a patient if a knight were to seek treatment. Basil's stomach growled. How's the meal? Shit. Teleos kicked at the patch of snow with his spilled rations for emphasis. Basil tried the partially frozen, unidentifiable mush, and then put it down without comment. A soldier in full armor came over to sit with them, and based on the stride, Bruceite guessed it was T-15. The number in ribbons confirmed it. Bruceite nodded at T-15. To Basil, Bruceite said, You should eat it all. You won't have enough energy to stay warm if you don't. What are you, the camp's mother? Teleos asked. You think you can live through this if you were starving? Bruceite motioned to the air around them. Basil doesn't have our armor. He isn't protected the way we are. He should eat. Basil had a disgusted look on his face, but he gulped the food down. After Basil finished, he brushed off ice crystals and clutched at the top of his thin leather boots. Teleos watched Basil, then looked to his own weatherproof boots. The next step we get, I need something for blisters. The bottom of my feet are getting them. With far too good a nature, Basil cast two spells in quick succession. Teleos stood to test out his healed souls. I made an extra layer of skin in between the existing and the old to give you thick calluses, Basil said. Teleos frowned in his twisted version of approval. Good. How rude. A healing would cost at least a table-cut gem, and Basil provided his services for free. Being trained under Master Watercress, he probably could have charged as much as a single cut. Teleost is such an ingrate. Soon the army lined up again, and the snaking formation to cross the path. After a short march, Dantrema's memorial shrine appeared over the horizon. The clouds partially blocked the bridge, but the part that shone through shimmered with a translucent film like a long, flat soap bubble. Because the viaduct was at the top of a Tapui mountain ridge, the elevated path was so narrow that defensive mages had to add a stability force field enchantment to widen the route to extend the merchant road from Tahal to Sithika. At least, that was what Bruceite's tutors had taught him. Asuel, please guard this crusade and give us safe passage. When Bruceite stepped onto the bridge's force field, he was comforted not to see the drop. However, his feet vanished below cloud vapors, and he took each step on the faith of the magic holding and the angels catching him if it didn't. Sweat beaded on his brow. He'll be fine. The bridge has never faltered before. Why would it just because I've stepped onto it? When the entirety of the crusade party was suspended over the viaduct, the bridge gradually shifted under his feet. To the left. To the right. Back to the left. I'm imagining the movement. Travelers frequently cross the path in massive groups. Merchants wouldn't visit Sithika if it were dangerous. The movement of the path cleared away the clouds, and he registered that the narrow physical portion of the tapui didn't sway as the edges did. He immediately moved to balance on the solid spine. Before he could call to the others to do the same, the path undulated forcefully. Someone's bewitched the viaduct! He called out in vain. Screams drowned out his words. Dozens of soldiers flew off the bridge and plummeted below the line of clouds. Each whip of the bridge tossed off more. Bruceite was grateful he could not see the bronze suits of armor landing below. Loud clangs of metal armor crunching through bone echoed all around them, but the sudden silence following their screams was more distressing. Nausea bubbled in Bruceite's stomach. He feared he'd lose his rations. To distract from the sensation, he checked on the others. Basil had stabilized himself, and Teleos had fallen to a ridge slightly below them. That lucky bastard. Other flailing bodies attempted to cling to the bridge's smooth surface for dear life. The rippling path tossed T-15, the silent soldier, into the air. His helmet turned toward Bruceite as if pleading for help. The section of the path that Bruceite stood upon was narrow, barely enough room to turn around, let alone support another person. I can't let him fall to his death. I must help him. Bruceite tore himself away from the stable, slender ridge and ran out along the raging path. A fierce jerk seized the bridge again. He stumbled but caught himself and kept running. As he neared, he stopped focusing on stabilizing his balance. He didn't have time to think. He only had moments to reach out a hand and grasp T-15's ankle before the man would plummet out of arm's reach. When Bruceite's hand made contact, he clasped the soldier's ankle so tightly he felt breaking one of his bones. 
He would gladly risk that to prevent the soldier from slipping through his hands. Brusite's shoulder nearly jolted out of its socket when he caught T-15's falling weight. Pain screamed from the joint along his spine. The silent soldier made a gruff startled sound at the sudden pressure and consequent tug of the grip against his foot. I can't believe I caught him. Despite the pain, relief surged through Brusite, then terror of dropping the man superseded it. Already, Brusite struggled to support the man with a single hand, and the grip, though tight, was at an uncomfortable angle. His arm ached, and he hauled the man upward with his injured shoulder. If the bridge's next undulation had dipped, they both would have tumbled, but the angels were kind to them and counteracted the fall with an upsurge. It hurt, but as the wave raised, Brusite got a second grip on the leather straps of the man's leg plate. With a great heave, Brusite lifted, and the soldier clawed at the smooth path. With the extra support, Brusite triumphed, and the two scrambled to safety on the ridge on all fours. Oh, thank you, Asiel. Brusite's lungs cut up with him, burning in agitation. He had never had his blood pulsing so hot in his face. Not when he exercised, not when he trained, and not even when he had been in the company of women. But at that moment, he was invincible, and his body let him know it. Once he calmed, he looked to the soldier. Still silent, the shy man dipped his head in gratitude before daring to stand again. The path wiggled, but it was settling. Reprieve finally set in. The soldier jerked Bruceite to his feet by his hurt shoulder and dragged him along the bridge. Bruceite was about to scold the man for his inconsiderate behavior, but then Bruceite noticed the crowd behind them storming to the opposite side of the pass. With the steadying of the bridge, the crowd seized the opportunity to run for safety. They would have trampled Bruceite had it not been for T-15. While sprinting, Basil's head bobbed up and down amongst the crowd in front of them. Teleos was right beside Basil. When the magical path shook again, they were almost to the end. The shifting was lesser, and once Brusite and the others crossed onto solid ground again, it stopped, flattening into the typical force field film as if nothing had happened. Even so, the rest of the people and oxen lingering on it ran to escape future potential peril. What was that? Others echoed the thought in their murmuring. I'm glad we all made it across, Basil said. Brusite looked to the silent soldier and then back to the rest of the group. I wonder how many didn't. Personally, I had a terrible fall. Teleos displayed his minor scrapes to the group. These wounds will take some time to heal, I am sure, but it's nothing I can't handle. Despite them, I miraculously pulled myself back up to the bridge. Basil rolled his eyes. I can help with your injuries. Still elevated from the adrenaline, Brusite laughed when he hadn't intended to. I'd like to see you do better getting thrown off that monstrosity. Ignoring Teleos, Brusite asked, Why would someone manipulate the enchantment? I would like to know that answer myself, Basil said. An announcement swept through the crowds. We're leaving the fallen behind, Basil gasped. But we can save some of them. Most who fell off died. Unless they fell onto a ridge or something, the fall would have finished them off, Teleos said. We could go scouring for some of the goods, but it's morbid to rummage through corpses regardless of how fresh they are. It would also be incredibly dangerous to scale to the bottom of the tapui. At least he has some sense of humanity even if it is only a sliver. The thought of the dead haunted Brusite. Wailing from nearby soldiers augmented his disquiet. Leaving the troubling topic alone, Teleos said, You know, that wasn't even my longest fall. I once fell from the city cliffs into the lake below when I was scouting the waters for the schools of fish. Teleos, that doesn't make any sense, Basil said. Lily pads cover the lake. You wouldn't be able to see them. It was windy and all the lily pads pushed to the side of the lake. Basil nodded along, but Brusite could tell he was only being polite. Basil shouldn't encourage him. Maybe then Teleos will stop talking. The ache ran through Brusite's shoulder again. He moved to massage the muscles with his opposite hand. Basil interrupted Teleos. Brusite, do you need a healing? You should save your herbs and spells for those who need them. Brusite tested out the shoulder's range of motion. Maybe once everyone else is better. Brusite's comment spurred the silent soldier into action. T-15 tapped Basil on the shoulder and pointed to someone who was writhing on the ground. As soon as Basil understood, he raced to the victim. Brusite lagged, but his curiosity prompted him forward. A boy probably around the age of eight lay in the snow, grasping at his bloodied, broken arm. What happened? Basil asked, looking the boy over. Tossed in the air. Landed hard on the bridge. Basil checked his neck and the sensation in his fingers and toes before proceeding. Brusite thought it absurd Basil would waste time on those areas when the problem obviously concerned the boy's arm. 
Okay, you don't have any permanent nerve damage. I'm going to set your arm. You should only feel a little pressure. Then I'll mend the bone. The kid nodded gravely. Basil recited a phrase in the ancient holy language. The only word that Bruce had understood was elm, which meant bone. Swirling blue light transferred from Basil's hand inside the boy's flesh. Soon the boy's tense expression relaxed. Bruce Light flinched as Basil pulled the arm straight out, turned it, and let the bone slip back into the correct position. Basil recited another spell, and the light inside the flesh remained there for a heartbeat more, before returning to Basil's hand. If you have additional pain, come find me. I can give you some herbs to make you feel better, Basil instructed. Thank you. With a grin plastered to his face, the kid got to his feet and dashed away. A crowd had gathered to watch the ordeal and applauded Basil's success. Bruce Light joined in while the child ran to a slave trading owner. Should Basil focus on healing the soldiers before the slaves? In the heat of the moment, I wouldn't have considered the idea. That was spectacular. Bruce had elbowed the silent soldier who had also witnessed Basil's abilities. Are there any others needing to be healed? The mustering horn sounded. The silent soldier nodded his head, then turned away to find his commanding officer. Bruce had speculated that T-15's ankle experienced the same agony that his shoulder did, and ignored it for the same reason he had. Based on the force of the catch, Bruce would have been astonished if the man was completely unscathed. After going through such a dangerous experience together, Bruce felt a strong connection to the man and wanted to befriend him. Besides, they had another six kingdoms to march through before they reached Sovain. They might as well become acquainted. It took some time for everyone to line up again. Approximately 200 of the 2,000 soldiers had been shaken from their lives when they were flung from the bridge. By the time everyone mustered, reorganized their lines, and restarted the march, the sun had plummeted. The crusade took off through the snow as soon as they were able, but there would only be a few hours of sunlight left. They would not reach the village of Dihal by evening as hoped. They would be lucky if they even crossed into the faint echo forest. As the landscape became increasingly mountainous, the sun sank below the hills on the northern and southern horizons until the sky and the snow ahead or a sprawling mix of warm oranges and reds that soon stained twilight blue. After the first sunset, there was only enough light to halt the progression. The oxen carts unloaded, officers having priority to claim supplies, then the other soldiers, and then the crown hires. Though some lost possessions over the viaduct, the unclaimed packs were given to those who had nothing left. The number of people lost was significantly higher than the number of travel packs. The redistribution effort lasted the final full turn of the suns. As part of his management and administration duties, Teleost worked the redistribution effort. Once Bruceite grabbed his tent, his arm screamed in pain again. I'll have to ask Basil for his services the next time I see him. Bruceite had gotten separated from Basil and the silent soldier during the rearrangements. Perhaps having some space would be pleasant after the day's chaotic events. Bruce Hart struggled to build his shelter by setting the wires into the required holes in the cloth. The less light he had, the more effort he needed to put into it. During training, they had practiced assembling the tents, but he wasn't any better doing it in the light than in the dark. After second sunset, Bruce Hart fumbled with the metal wires until the loggers brought lumber for fires and the lamplighters ignited the stacks. Between his strained arms and his failing memory, Bruce Hart struggled to pitch the tent, but he could at least see what he was doing. After T-15 finished building his tent, he helped Bruceite. Thank you, but I can assemble it, Bruceite said, trying not to sound ungrateful. The soldier turned his head toward him for a moment before returning to work. The gesture was a pointed one. Perhaps he's mute, or maybe the man has been so horrifically disfigured by a battle wound or an accident that it left a gruesome impression upon his face and vocal abilities. Bruce had decided against pushing the unknown man to speak. Instead, he tried yes or no questions. So, friend, are you from Scythica? The silent soldier did not respond. It was worth a try. When they completed the tent's construction, Bruce had asked, You want to see if they're serving dinner yet? The soldier again ignored his question, entered his own tent, and emerged with a strange bow and quiver full of arrows. T-15 took off to the hills, and Bruce had followed, offering, I can come with you to hunt. It might be safer. You never know when a herd of Maros might come along. The silent soldier shook his head. Dejected, Bruce Hite decided his appetite could wait. He investigated his own tent. He crawled into the familiar material and laid out his blankets in the back corner so he wouldn't trek dirty slush where he slept. 
There was enough space to fit himself, his equipment, and his armor, but that was it. He unpacked his few belongings and organized them to his liking. If more oxen carts had plummeted, we would be at a loss for sleeping space. There's not enough room for two soldiers to share a tent. They'd end up sprawled over each other, especially if they're both as burly as I am. As for protection from the elements, the fabric blocked the wind, but it was still chilly inside. Master Cirrus had assured Bruceite's superiors that the weather-resistant enchantments would protect the soldiers from freezing to death during the night, as their armor protected them during the day, but Bruceite was skeptical that was true. With his tent ready, Bruceite sought out his dinner rations. Creaking moans leapt from the nearest bonfire as the flames grew and the woodpile collapsed in on itself. Sitting at its edge, Bruceite warmed. A culinary specialist prepared the evening meal, pouring broth into a pot and setting up an iron toaster to roast over the logs. Reluctant to leave the newfound heat, Bruce had considered moving on to a fire with finished rations available. A more compelling thought was to find Basil, but his instincts rejected leaving the blaze. Bruce's mind wandered, and turned back to the unfortunate souls thrown from the viaduct. He had felt off since it had happened, but he hadn't spent many thoughts for them. He was confused about what he should think, or better yet, do. He hadn't known anyone in the crusade party well, but he had met many of them through his family and his military schooling. Because I didn't know them, does that justify not reacting? Should I force myself to mourn? Would that dishonor the dead? What is right? Death was complicated, and he was overthinking it. Oh, this sourdough is terrible. Telios traipsed up to Bruceite with food in hand. They better have good food in Tahal. Do you know what Tahal means? Bruceite asked. I have to admit, I don't speak the angel's tongue, no. It means wasteland. We won't get to better climate until we reach Ikasu. Queen Amatrine contracts more weather mages than King Citrine does. Damn, we won't have a decent meal for a while, then, Telios said. What do you mean? We lost too many oxen carts carrying rations. We'll have to skimp until we can restock. Bruceite knitted his brows together. Didn't we lose more people than carts? We did, but the carts we lost carried food. The only ones that survived carried other supplies, like the tents. Where'd you learn the holy language? The abrupt change in conversation confused Bruceite. My father supplied my siblings and me with tutors. It's virtually useless knowledge, though. When the archangels rarely even contact Spawn, it would be absurd for them to talk to a random human. Telios shrugged. True. The two soldiers sat in silence. The logger and the fire starter maintained the blaze until the cook finished heating the rations. Telios peered at Bruceite's helping as if sizing up whether he had received less, but Bruceite ignored him. While they ate, Basil found them. Has the priestess already spoken? Basil asked. Nope. Bruceite glanced around the fire's light. My master said that Faith would speak every evening, but maybe he was wrong. Oh, great, Telios mumbled. Why can't they let us sleep in peace? Is it supposed to be mandatory to attend the service? To answer Telios' question, D4 stood atop a pile of unburnt logs near their tent cluster and shouted, Faith will hold an evening prayer and service around this fire. If we want to be warm, then we'll be lectured at. Telios grumbled before heading to his tent. Warm the flesh, warm the soul, Bruceite said. There are other fires that you can sit at out of listening range. Telios had already shut himself away by the time Bruceite finished speaking. Basil fidgeted. Would you prefer to move to a different fire? Bruceite asked. Basil glanced toward the priestess who replaced the major general atop the logs. He said, I never really attended services before, but I am curious. Do you want to stay? I will. I need to show gratitude for Asiel for giving me the strength to help T-15. I saw your catch. It was amazing. But I've been unsettled after the viaduct. Especially after losing some of my patients earlier. Honestly, I could use the assurance. The two listened together as the priestess projected to the camp. They could see Faith above the line of tents, lit from a fire between them. Let us start tonight's prayer, thinking of those who passed today. We pray to the angels to alleviate any suffering they may have experienced before death, and we beg the demons not to add to their ailments. We hope that whichever spawn might judge them will lead their souls into eternal bliss. We further ask the spawn are led down the correct path for their own sake as well. Let us take a moment to remember our comrades and friends. 
Bruce I did not know the white-haired priestess, but he appreciated her honoring of the dead. He bowed his head and wished the ghosts well through death's journey. The gesture comforted him. It was the only deed he could do for them now. Faith waved her wrinkled hands and spread her arms open as she prayed toward the sky. We pray the weather permits us safe passage across the harsh terrain expected to come. We pray there will be enough food and water to sustain us. We pray the northern soldiers safeguard the spawn until our arrival, and we pray the Rysiglai cease their attacks before then. If anyone has other prayers to add, please do so now. Several soldiers spoke. I raise a prayer for my mother that I may meet her again in this lifetime. I pray for good fortune on this journey. I pray that the spawn bless us. I pray that the ark spawn blesses us. The crowd sent out dozens of prayers. When they quieted down, Priestess told a story from Asiel's teachings and spoke to the message of curtailing hate with forgiveness. It was nice, and it was short. If she had to preach every night, it was probably wise to limit the length. Additional shots of pain sporadically streaked through Bruceite's shoulder during the service, so he jumped to ask Basil for a healing as soon as the service concluded. Basil cast, Kriath Mosindi, and a numbing pool of energy spiraled around Bruceite's shoulder joint. You should have asked for help sooner. This feels like it hurt. You can sense that from your spell, Bruceite asked. In a way, I can diagnose ailments with it. My master actually created the sorcery and wrote the tome. I'm glad he did, too. It's the only spell I use for practically every patient. That's handy. Has he written many tomes? Basil cast another spell. Several. He's skilled at it. Most sorcerers might only produce a single tome in their lifetime, if any at all. But Master Watercrest will complete one in a turn of the moons if he has reason to. Bruceite tested the joint out, pleased with the reduction in pain. Thank you for this. Returning to the topic, Bruceite said, We must care for you dearly. I should hope so. He raised me. But how do you mean? Basil asked. To go through the effort to scribe the tomes. Even if he's a master sorcerer, he still must write out an entire volume's worth of work for the sole purpose of improving your repertoire of skills as a wizard. I'm certain it's a painstaking process. My family only owns a couple of books because scribing is tedious and expensive work. Basil was about to reply when D4 approached Basil and asked to speak with him in private. What would the Major General need to say to the healer's apprentice? Perhaps someone needs excessive medical treatment. Bruceite knew he should head back to his tent if he were going to get a proper night's sleep. For the time, he listened to the priestess speak with several older men who crowded around her. He speculated whether their interests were strictly religious in the male-dominated camp. When he considered it, he had maybe only seen one or two women among the soldiers. Bruceite had a funny grin on his face when the voiceless soldier returned to camp with a snow deer balanced across his shoulders. The culinary specialist who had prepared their rations had retired, so Bruce had helped the fellow soldier skewer the beast themselves. Few lingered by the surrounding fires, but all who noticed the animal seemed interested in second helpings to their dinner. You have my gratitude, Bruce had said. Several other soldiers joined in with their own thanks. Still, the soldiers stayed silent. There was not even a head nod to acknowledge their appreciation. Once the deer had been cooked and served, Bruce sat beside the soldier while they ate. I hope I haven't offended you, Bruce said. But we could be friends. I understand if you can't talk or don't want to. I don't mind doing extra. T-15 paused, but then lifted his face mask. Bruce hoped T-15 would finally talk to him, but he didn't. It was only for him to eat. Around the sides of his mouth, he had birch-colored skin, a lighter tone than most others from Vetron. Bruce continued, D-4 dragged Basil away. I wonder what for. I'm pretty sure Teleost went to bed. I don't like Teleost, but I might teach him the holy language. He seems interested in learning it. He's a pain, but if I do something nice, then he might not be so obtuse. The soldier tore away at his portion cut from the deer. If you're interested in the language, I can teach you too. I'm not fluent by any means, but I know some vocabulary. I studied it for a while, but my sisters were much better with the grammar. The soldier paused, perhaps more interested in the conversation. Bruce chuckled. Hey, don't get any ideas now. My sisters are all either married or engaged. They're all older than me, so I guess that's to be expected. The soldier returned his gaze to the meat, but ate a little less savagely. I have brothers, too. A bunch of them. They're great. They're all also older than I am. At 22, I'm the runt of the family. 
The soldier looked in his direction. Bruce had thought the glance was a skeptical one, but without seeing the man's eyebrows, he couldn't tell. I know I don't look much like a runt, but when I was younger, I sure was. I was an armrest, a footrest, a clothes hanger, pretty much anything my brothers wanted to use me for. You know, I didn't expect to become a soldier. I figured my father would marry me off to some lord's daughter. He tried once, but not again after that. I never asked him why he didn't. Maybe I was too impatient for him to find someone. <laughs> Maybe he couldn't find me under all my other siblings. Bruce was in a good mood, spilling his life's story to the stranger. Basil returned, having found himself a slice of the leg. What was that about? Bruce had asked when Basil took a seat. Basil narrowed his peculiar golden eyes. The Major General wanted to clarify a few specifications regarding our arrangement. Arrangement? Basil shivered and stuck his hands out in front of the fire. He instructed me on how to complete my duties as a mage's apprentice. Did D4 order him to prioritize healing soldiers over slaves? Better not pry. It's not my business. Well, our friend over here provided the deer. Bruce I gestured to the silent man. I cannot begin to tell you how much I appreciate the meal. Basil took a bite. The meat is excellent. The soldier stood and left. Perhaps he's shy. Tired? Nearly dying would be exhausting. I'm glad we got a hearty addition to our rations. We'll need all we can get for the next leg of the beastly journey ahead. <laughs>